Hello, you all come to Destiny Masterclass, the final session with Sam Yayola. You're watching this, I want to assume that you've watched the first session where we had a live session and we really dig deep on the necessity for a dream as the foundation on which any life can be built in the kingdom of God. So it means what we have established is the fact that until you have an accurately scripted and, dif and divine um, dream, you have no future in view. We went further to say that a dream is a divinely inspired picture or an idea within your consciousness, your imagination, that is very real to you, in which your calling is established, your vision is realized, your purpose is fulfilled, and also your influence is evidently felt. So we said in the kingdom of God, we don't deal with it like the way it is dealt with in the world, because in the world, someone can say, oh, I have a dream, and my dream is to become an astronaut. I have a dream. My dream is to buy this big house. My dream is to own this big mansion. My dream is to marry so number of wives. But yeah, that's not what it's about. Because Jesus said, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of the things that he has. So there is something that God has created for that you and I become. And that thing, discovering it, and then having a mental picture of what the fulfillment of it is on the earth is very important. The moment that is done, that is when we truly have a life that is meaningful to pursue on the earth, which will be also backed up by God and by grace to make happen and actualize. So we did mention in that teaching that having a dream is only the beginning but there is something beyond that. And in this second session, we are going to just do a brief recap of that first session um, in the shortest possible minute or five minutes. It is meant to refresh your mind concerning what we discussed. And by now, I believe you have also worked on your worksheet. In case you are not in that class, I recommend you get the link in the description of this video and make sure you watch it. It's a very long teaching of over two hours and you have to be extremely patient because we have to flesh it into pieces in a manner which it will be very easy for everyone to understand. And so also go ahead, join the uh, Telegram community, download the workbook and make sure that you use it. And the good news is this, we have it as an online tool right now, which you can go and fill in your assessment and within 24 hours, after your assessment has been filled, you get an analysis containing information, you know, from members of our team. I have no doubt that this video will be a blessing to you. Get ready for an experience. In session one, you had a teaching. In session two, you will have an experience. An experience in which if you follow through, we take you from where you are to the next phase and next levels of life. Who is this video for? This video is for someone a believer, a Christian, who has this big dream and is asking, how can I achieve it? This video is for someone who believes that I am created for something big, but right now I cannot lay hold and find a meaning for my life. And so how do I actualize it? How do I discover it? And how do I realize that great destiny that I have. This video is for someone who has gotten to a point in life that it's as if you have plateaued. It's as if you are eating bricks when going up. Every time you try to go up, you eat this brick wall, you come down, and although you don't get finally down, but as you're coming down, you pick up again, and with renewed vigor, energy, thinking, let me go. As the moment you get to this point, it becomes like a lead over your life and you find yourself eating this and then coming back again. This video is for you as you get ready to break every form of barrier and then advance, you know, to your next levels in destiny. Again, I am Sam Jayola. I want to encourage you that you pick out your um, notepad and um, your pen. Take down your action points. Everything that will be taught here, I want you to make sure that you apply them into your life. So in the session one, we dealt with 
the foundation, which is the dream. We dealt with foundation, which is dream. And we did a lot of work. Again, if you've not watched that video, I encourage that you get the video. And we said the first thing you need to do on the journey to elevating your life is to clarify your dream. Dream clarity is important because a wise man once said that clarity accounts for about 75% of your pursuits. So whether you achieve what you want to achieve in life, a goal in life is as determined by the clarity. Why? What is clear to you is what you can run with. The clearer it becomes to you, the more you gain speed. The clearer it becomes to you, the more you'll be able to harness all your resources together to actualize that one thing, the more focused you become. That's why the subject of clarity cannot be overflogged. So it's very important you know this. So we said, how do you identify a kingdom dream? Your dream must establish four things. There are four parts to your dream according to that definition. Number one, your calling. And um, I've shared with us in the previous session that your calling is simply an invitation, God inviting you into your destiny. I describe that also as something that validates you. It gives you self-validation. Yes, you know you have a great destiny. You know there is a plan of God for your life. But then how do you fulfill it? Are you sure you're the one? So that consciousness, that confidence comes in your calling. Many people, um, I don't know whether you've discussed with many people or even yourself, and you're asking yourself, are you sure Are you sure you can do this thing? Even when God has spoken to you or when God has put some ideas in your head and you're asking yourself, are you sure I can do this? No, 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 I can't. I can't do this. You remember the story of Gideon in the Bible when the angel of the Lord met him and he told him, oh, you mighty man of valor. He said, who is the mighty man of valor? Me? My father is the least in the entire Israel. I am least in my father's house. So it was, at times, circumstances will beat you down and the reality, the harsh reality of your environment will make you feel you're nothing. It is in your calling that you get that self-validation. For Jesus, you are my beloved son. You are not the son of the carpenter. A woman well-placed. And so that made him to go ahead and in Luke chapter four, he began to say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. They clear this vision. So number one, you're calling. Number two, your purpose. Your purpose is what was in the heart of God, in the mind of God before he sent you here. So your purpose pre-existed you. Your purpose was established before you became necessary. As a matter of fact, your purpose is what necessitated you in the first place. So to journey in life without purpose is to waste your destiny. So every dream that is not connected to your purpose will only lead you to frustration. And in case you succeed because men cause it success, when you get to heaven, you answer for it. So it's very important. Number three, it's your vision. Your vision is also in your dream. So that singular statement which you have been asked to craft in the last session must contain your calling, must contain your purpose, your vision. Your vision is the vehicle or the pathway, the tangible vehicle, the tangible pathway through which your purpose is fulfilled. Your purpose is released, your purpose is fulfilled through your vision. So we may not be able to know your purpose. You can't be telling everybody, this is my purpose. But then if there's anything we can see, we can see your vision in action. So for Jesus, his purpose was, he will save his people from their sin. And um, But what was his vision? The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives, to open the blind eyes, and to preach the good news to the poor. And then he went forward like that. And finally, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And so, how do we know the purpose of Jesus? We're not there when the angel was telling his mother. We're not there when... Perhaps God was revealing to him his purpose. But one thing we can see, we can see his vision. He was around, going about preaching. He was going about healing. He was going about teaching. He was going about healing the sick. So every time he was doing that, we could have a pointer to the fact that we have an idea of what his purpose is. And remember I shared with us in that last session that your purpose most times, after you're long gone, your purpose remains. So your purpose doesn't just impact on your generation, even generation unborn, if truly your purpose is released and fulfilled on the earth. 
So there are many people that are dead in business, many people dead in ministry, many people dead in academics. And you discover something that their legacy, and that's what you call legacy, their legacy is still living. Someone like uh, the great reformer, Martin Luther. Martin Luther is long gone to be with the Lord. But the purpose which necessitated his coming to the earth, since he had gone, that purpose is still speaking today. And many of us are still being blessed in the Christian faith up to date. So that's what you must know. That's why you have um, necessity is laid on you to fulfill your purpose. Because it's not about you, it's about God's plan for the earth. And if you fulfill that purpose, there is great joy in heaven. And many generations of born will be blessed. And so, number four, your identity. So, it's in your dream that we know who you are. It's in your dream you also know who you are. So, your dream must convey your identity. Your identity is who you are on the face of the earth. What sets you apart from every other person on the earth. I know what makes me unique. I know who I am. And I am very conscious of who I am. I'm not saying the general, I'm the light of the world. No, that's not what we're saying here. We're talking about your identity by function. What's your function? In that dream, when you look at your dream, when you look at the purpose, calling, vision, and when you look at everything, what can you briefly summarize them into that defines you? So that becomes your function on the earth. And so when people ask, who are you? Can I meet you? In the shortest possible time, you want to introduce who you are based on your function. That's your identity. Every time Jesus went about, you remember what Jesus was told, what was told Jesus in his college. So anytime he went about places, the, the, the Pharisees wanted to kill him because of one thing, because he said, I'm the son of God. Nobody has ever said that before he came. So it's very important that you know this. It's very important that you know this so that we can fulfill destiny. So now I believe you have clarified your dream. And in case you have not, go back to that video, watch it again. Use the online assessment tool and let us have your response. Um, our team member will reach out to you and get you um, more details and information that will help your clarity level. I believe that will be of help to you. Now, and it was on this point that we said that once you have a dream that consists of these four, you just naturally discover your area of influence, which has been assigned to you by God. Because there is a name you were called, that's your identity in heaven. And I shared that destiny was concluded, it was designed, shaped, concluded in heaven. And before you were delivered to the earth. Now you are delivered to the earth to become who heaven has designed already before sending you here. So that as it is in heaven, it can be so on the earth. So who you are in heaven, you must be on the earth. When heaven sees you, who does heaven see that was sent? That person must manifest for the world to see because it is that person that the entire world is waiting for. Let me tell you this. The reason why some of us, we are struggling, you know, uh, with financial issues, the reason why we are struggling with failures and all manner of things, and you're like, my life doesn't have a meaning, is because everything on the earth, everything, all creation, human being, things, forces of the supernatural, they are all programmed to relate with one person, not the current you. They are programmed to answer and respond to that person that God sent, that designed personality. So when you discover that personality in your dream and you start becoming it, everything must work together. And that's why the scripture says in Romans 8.28 that for we know all things work together for good for them that love God, but much more importantly, who are called according to his purpose. So it's important. You must know that purpose that you were called on to and start becoming it. The moment you start becoming it, things begin to fall in place for you because the endless expectation of the creation waits eagerly for the manifestation of the sons of God. So that's very important. And so many of us, the prayers we are praying now wouldn't have been very necessary. Rather, start praying, Lord, show me, not Lord, give me. Very important because the moment you see who you ought to become and you start becoming that person, very easy, everything you need will be supplied. That's why I shared with us the last time that the power that you were promised when you give your life to Christ is the power of transformation, the power to become. So to become the son of God, to become who you are meant to be. So when you have done this, you naturally see your assigned area of influence. 
And so Apostle Paul was speaking in the scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. He said, but we not boast beyond limits, but we boast only with regards to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even you. So from this scripture, it is established that there are assigned area of influence. There is an assigned area of influence for me. For you, there's an assigned area of influence. Now, to someone, his assigned area of influence will be on the pulpit. To another person, his assigned area of influence we be in the media, to someone in culture and entertainment, in art, for another person, academics, for someone in commerce, in industry, in politics, and so many other areas. You know what? All of us are preachers. We are all ministers of reconciliation. And so this assigned area of influence is where we go to preach with our lives and to make men see God. Because actually when people are looking for God, it's not just by talking, it's when you manifest God from who is inside of you, you manifest him. And the moment you manifest his potency, his character, his attribute, his wisdom. When you manifest that, the entire creation, that's what they are looking for. You become the answer to the question in their heart. You become the solution, you become the, the person that fills up the void in their, um, or the vacuum in their heart. And suddenly, when they discover God, they come and meet you to fulfill that prophecy of the scripture in Zechariah chapter 7. And when you read, when you begin to read it from, I think, verse 20 to 23, that it shall happen in the last days that, you know, 10 unbelievers will hold on to the cloak of him that is a Jew, that is a believer, and say, take us to the Lord your God. They don't know him. You didn't even preach to them. You didn't open your mouth to preach, but your life is a living epistle. And they say, why? For we have seen that he is with you. So men must see. It's when you start living out your dreams, people begin to see God. And that doesn't have to be in the church because you are the light of the world, not the light of the church. You are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. So you must begin to look outside at your mission field. So our mission field is actually outside the church. It's in the world. So let's go to the world. That was what Jesus taught us. Go to the world, disciple, nations. Nations there doesn't mean Nigeria, you know. No, what it ta what's talking about is territories, discipled group of people, discipled territory. It may be an association of professionals. That's nation in the Greek word. So it's very important we understand what the Global Commission is all about. And this is what it's all about. Dif discover your assigned area of influence and begin to express the person that God has put in you and packaged in you by serving humanity. And as you begin to dispense um, the dispensation of God that has been loaded inside of you, people will begin to see God. And then when they see your results, they will glorify God. At that point, you're fulfilling destiny. So we move on to the second step. So enough of clarify your dream. We move on to the second step, which is prioritize your dream. That dream which you have been able to script down. It's important you identify what are the things or other pursuits, other desires within me that can contest or contend for the place of my dream. It's important. Don't just assume God has said this, this is what God said. And no, no, I know God spoke to you. But now, you know, I shared with you that your dream must become something that is really your imagination. So some of us, what God spoke to us in the process of putting it down as a dream, we limit the ability of God that we try to make sure that our dream is small. No, you can't dream small. Dream big. Your, your dream must terrify you. So when you have small dreams, this is what happened. God did not give you small dreams. God gave you your vision, and when God gave you your vision, you took it, and you are the one that brought it into a dream. God gave you an idea, you envisioned it, and your envisioning of it is as determined by your perspective. Very important. So if your dream is small, one thing that happens is this. You run a risk of abandoning it, and you'll see why very soon. Now, in the scriptures, Jesus talked about a man. He said, the kingdom of God is like a man that discovered a field that contains treasure. And he hid it from any other person. He didn't tell people. He ran away. He went and sold all that he had and gained enough money to buy that land. And he was joyful. He went ahead and said that the kingdom of God also is like goodly pairs that a man discovered and sold all he had to get that one thing. And he greatly rejoiced. So that means 
what we are saying, the other implication of that scripture to this is, what is that kingdom dream that is within you? What have you found that is uh, worth pursuing in your life that you are willing to forsake every other thing? So when you discover your dream, when you put your dream down, that dream must beat every other pursuit hands down. It must become your singular life pursuit because life is only programmed to pursue one thing. It becomes your pursuit that every other thing is sacrificed. You are living that dream at the expense of every other thing. Your dream will cost you something. So if you can't count the cost, then you are not truly having a dream. So that's what we want you to do. So that in the next two years, three years, four, five years, you don't just see another thing and then you pursue your dream. You want to make sure that your dream can accommodate your growth. Your dream can accommodate your other desires. Your dream can accommodate you know, your picture of the future, very important. So how do you go about that? Number one, write out two other strong desires that you have within you. And you know, at this point, don't play down, don't play small. Do you have any other thing that you want to do? When, since when you were young, you've always thought, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. You know why? God calls you to both liberty and to a bondage. Permit me to say that. And you find that in 1 Corinthians 7, I think, verse 15. So, the one that God called is the Lord's free man, but he's also the slave of God. So, that dream that you have right now, that divinely inspired dream, becomes what you are slave to. You, that's only one thing you are living for. You are running with it, but it also gives you freedom from other pursuits. So, it's, that's the balance now. You must know that. So what are those two other things which you equally want to pursue? Once you have done that, write the benefit that if I pursue these other dreams, what are the benefits I will get from it? Then the next thing is you want to test the quality of the fulfillment of your dream against these other two in relative to their results. So pick your dream and tell yourself, if I pursue this dream, what are the things that I will benefit? Now, the benefit of pursuing my dream and the benefit of others, does it cover for these other two areas of pursuit? In most times, if your dream is a kingdom one, if your dream is a valid one, if your dream is a big one, I tell you something, you discover that every other thing you'd have gotten, which is a benefit from other pursuits, you'll find it in your dream when your dream is realized and fulfilled. So it's very important. So if at this point, your answer is no, if at this point, your dream cannot accommodate other results, then you may have to go back to the drawing board and, you know, work on your perspective again. Try to craft that dream again in such a way that it gives you all-round success in every area of your life. Now, and one thing you must know is this, the moment you have been able to prioritize your dream and you have answered that question in the affirmative that yes, my dream is more important than these two others because it can deliver the gains and the benefits to me. What next do you do? You must carry these three in mind. The three don'ts to prioritize your dream. It must be a rule for you. There was this story of a young man that met with Jesus Christ um, possibly in the final year of Jesus on the earth. And you know, Jesus was just 33 years old. So this young man met with Jesus and was telling him, uh, Master, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, do you know what? If you want to follow me, now abandon everything and follow me. And this young man said, please permit me. My father just died. He left some, you know, <laughs> my father just died. Let me go and bury him. Now, that was just a simple statement, but I want to believe it's beyond that. Possibly the guy was the first burn, and then he was thinking, the properties my father left behind, I need to administer it. I need to make sure everything is just well balanced. Let me just, you know, put things in order and then make sure that nobody steals our properties. Let me make sure that my mom is well catered for, which is very good. You know, I have, I'm not like you, Jesus. I have responsibilities. And so... Jesus told him something. He said, let the dead bury themselves. But you know what happened? We were never told that he followed Jesus. Peter, we were told he followed. Andrew followed. Every other person that Jesus spoke to that followed him, the Bible was specific that they followed. But this young man, the Bible never recorded that they followed. You know, in the imagination of the man, the man would have felt, well, my father is dead. My mom is old. You know, <laughs> those guys will soon pass on. So why not? This guy is still young. I can always still meet him. 
He never knew that perhaps maybe that was the last time Jesus was going to pass through his community. He never knew Jesus was in his own final seasons. And that's the same thing with us. We must know that when opportunities come to us, when God is calling us to do something, when God is giving us, you know, this dream that we have in us right now, we must never delay. And that's why three things you must know. Number one, don't negotiate. Don't negotiate with God concerning your dream. Don't negotiate your dream. Don't say there are things I want to do. So, And it's to solve that problem. That's why I had you go through writing other two things that could contain the place of your dream. So you don't have anything to negotiate. Don't negotiate your dream. Because if you negotiate your dream, you will suffer losses. Number two, don't procrastinate. Procrastination is the graveyard of destinies. It's the graveyard of dreams. It's the graveyard of opportunities. If it must be done, let it be done. Don't say, I will do it tomorrow. Um, one of my mentors said that the best time to undo today, the best time to take control of today is when it's still tomorrow. When it is called tomorrow, that is when you can do it. So it means what you would have wanted to do tomorrow, start doing it today. Because when that tomorrow comes, it will be called today. And by then you have conquered it. So don't procrastinate. If it is worth doing, it's worth doing now. Number three, don't hesitate. Don't be someone that is of prompt action. The moment you have defined, you have analyzed, the moment you um, you are sure of what you want, you've clarified it, go for it. Don't waste time. Delay can be dangerous. Very important. You know, we often say delay is not denial. Well, that's to, <laughs> that's to give you hope. When you delay... Uh, you can miss out on the opportunities because there are opportunities that come your way that are time bound. You see, your dream also, you must know, is time bound. You miss the timing of your dream, you have lost your opportunity. You are not denied. No, it has slipped out of your hand forever. That's the meaning. Now, having dealt with the first step, which is clarify your dream. Second, we moved on to prioritizing your dream. Now that you have prioritized your dream, you know that one thing that you have found that is worthy of pursuit. By the way, let me say that until you have found something you are willing to die for, you have not really found something that makes you worthy of living. So there must be something that you are willing to sacrifice your life for that can cost you your life and you are ready to let go. It's very important you know that. And that's scriptural because Jesus said, I willingly lay down my life. Nobody took it from me because I have the power to both lay it down, that is to both commit my life to it and to both refrain from it. So it is that point, you get to a point where you are totally sold out and totally dedicated to that dream. And that dream is your cause for living. That's what sponsors the justification for your existence in the first place. So having done that, we move on to the number three, which is the third step. Please, I'd like you to take this very serious because it's very practical also, like other steps would be. And in case you have not been doing um, anything like working on what we have been discussing to, so far, it's at this point you want to pause and make sure you do something that we've done so far. Because from this point onwards, it will amount to a waste of time. If you are not doing anything, you are going to spend the next um, one hour, like one hour, 15 minutes dealing with what you have done so far. So if you've not done anything so far, kindly pause this video, go back to what we've taught and make sure you come up with something. It doesn't have to be perfect, but make sure you have something in your end that you are dealing with right now so that you are building on it. And at the end of the day, you will really thank me for it so that you don't waste your time. So we move on to analyzing your dream. The dream that you have prioritized, it's time to analyze it. And how do I analyze it? Uh, there are many things you can do to analyze dreams, but I wouldn't want this to be a complex compound situation for you. So we'll keep it simple. The simplest way and the most effective way to do this is to create a problem statement. The moment you have a problem statement, it helps you to do some specific analysis. A good problem statement will reveal to you what the problem is, where it occurs, when it happens, how often it happens, who experiences it, and why the problem matters. 
That's what a good problem will do to you. So we want to make sure you have a grasp of it. So this is still like you are trying to clarify your dream. You are trying to make a detail out of it. But at this point, you are analyzing it so that you can really know what your dream entails. Now, how do you go about that? Before I go on to that, I'd like you to know this, that the society has taught us and encouraged us to avoid problems. Nobody wants problems. Nobody wants crisis. Nobody wants challenges. But one thing you must know is that as a child of God, you were created as a solution to an existing problem. Every child of God is, an, is a solution to an existing problem. So your relevance, my relevance, is tied to how we are able to identify the problem and then deploy our lives to solving that problem. Now listen to this. You carry answers within you. As a matter of fact, I am an answer to the dying question of my generation. The same thing with you. Now, answers are irrelevant without questions. Carrying this bundle of answers within you, you must go for the questions. Look for the questions. Carrying these answers within you, carrying this solution within you, look for the problems. So we are not talking about in this session that you have to create some solutions. No, you are an embodiment of solutions. What you need to look for is to look for the existing problems. Remember I told you earlier on that it was your purpose that necessitated your coming. Your purpose necessitated your calling. So in other words, there was an existing problem. That's why you are called to solve the problem. So look out for the problems. Don't avoid problems. As a matter of fact, I know this, that problems come to solutions. Problems want to be solved. So they are looking for solution bearers. And that's why some problems, crises have been lingering, lingering around you, beckoning on the solution inside of you to come out. But unfortunately, we don't know. So we keep running away from problems. I challenge you from today, look out for the problems. Wherever you find the problems, run there because there is something inside of you to solve such problems. So we need problems to be significant and relevant in life. We must learn how to look for these problems, identify them, and present them to the society in a way and manner where we'll be given the opportunity or the platform to provide answers that we possess within us. Very important. Inside you are the answers that the world is crying and groaning to get. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2, the prophet Habakkuk was praying to God, and it got to a point the Lord said, write the vision down. We all know that scripture. Make it plain so that he that will run it may run, he that reads it may run with it. But before we got to that point, you should ask yourself, how did Habakkuk get to a point of running with vision? Go to Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 1. You see it there. The Bible said, the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. So Habakkuk had the revelation of a problem, of a crisis, of an abnormal situation. So it was the revelation of the abnormal situation, the insight into the challenges and the problem, the chaos in town that actually make him to begin to seek for solutions. And so when he knew the problem, he was clear about the problem, he was able to prefer the solution. And that solution was that he should now write the vision down. So there was a solution which became his vision. So he needed to write it down so that he can now begin to run with it, which we will get to. There is a place we get to whereby you have to be able to state the plan of action to solve these problems. But you have to be able at this point to clearly state the problem. When you are uh, tapped in the day, in the night, you should know the problem you are here to solve. One problem, not many problems. There is one problem that is going to call for your attention. There is one problem that when you focus on, you will be relevant. There is one problem that when you focus on, the glory of God in you will be showcased and you will enjoy total fulfillment. That's why you need to be able to create your problem statement, the problem statement that your dream will address. And so there are different ways to do that. But before we do that, you must know this, that your problem statement clarifies the current situation by specifically identifying the problems, its severity, the location, and even the financial impact. 
Secondly, the problem statement serves as, as a great communication tool, helping you to get buy-in and support from others because you cannot run it alone. Like that scripture tells us, so that he that reads it may run it. So you cannot, you can conceive the vision, but you cannot make it to actualization. So you need other people. How do you propose it to other people? How do you relate it to other people? You must have a valid problem statement. When they see the crisis, they see the problem, they want to be part of the solution. So they join you. So that's very important. So how do I create a problem statement? That's the next question you should be asking. At this point, bring out your writing materials and let's go on this journey. There are two models I've identified and these models were inspired by the Holy Ghost um, two years ago. I've been doing this for some time, but two years ago, I received this model. So I had to, I've actually had to stick to them and I've seen them help several people to simplify the process of writing a problem statement. Within the next 10 minutes, if you follow through on these that will be taught, you'll be able to write your problem statement. What you have been trying to, what is that problem I'm here to solve? You will be amazed that you will do it very cheaply with the help of the Holy Ghost. So the IRECOP model, when I say IRECOP model, what do I mean? IRECOP is an acronym of what I will spell out now. Number one, ask yourself, what is the ideal situation? So that idea stands for ideal situation. What's the ideal situation? Let's assume there are no problems or crisis at all that my dream will solve. You know your dream by now. Without any problem, what is the ideal situation in the world? What's the ideal situation in my territory? What's the ideal situation among people? A world without crisis in this area of my dream. Now, when you have done that, you ask yourself this question, if there wasn't a problem at all, what would be the situation? The people, the society, the organization, institutions, what will they look like? This helps you to identify the goals and the scope of your dreams, the ideas and the vision that surrounds your dreams. So that's what it helps you to identify. It should create a clear understanding of what the ideal environment will be once the issue has been resolved. It helps to sharpen your vision, the vision of that is contained in your dream. So it shows you the ideal situation. So that's the first thing you want to do. What's the ideal situation? Number two, I'll give us a case study and an example very soon. What's the current reality? So the R, E, the, the capital letter R and small letter E talks about reality. What's the present reality? Now that you know the ideal situation in a world where there is no crisis or problem, what's the current reality? What you can relate with for now? Now, you should describe what the current reality is for the situation, the people, society, organizations that you are considering in your dream. This will help you to identify what the problem is, why it is a problem, and what the problem is impacting. So it will solve three things for you. What the problem is, you will identify the what, you will identify the why it is a problem, and you will identify who will benefit from the solution or who the problem is impacting upon. It will also describe when and where the problem was identified. The third thing you need to do is write out the consequences, as many as you can think of. What are the consequences of the problem at hand? Now you have identified the ideal situation in a world where there are no problems. You have identified the current reality. Now that the problem has set in the effect of the problem. Now what are the consequences of the problem? You need to state or identify what these consequences are. This describes the effect of the problem that by describing how the people affected by the problem are being impacted and quantifying how much the problem is impacting them. Common consequences can include the loss of time, can include ideologies being destroyed, can include destruction of a certain age group, can include loss of competitive advantage in terms of organizations, can include loss of resources, can include lack of productivity, depending on what your dream is all about, what your dream is programmed to address and the group of people. You know, it can even, if, if in, in ministry, pulpit-based ministry, it can include 
increase in carnality. So those are the things we're talking about. You must be able to identify the consequences. And lastly, what's your proposal to solving the problem? What's your proposal? And at this point, state all the possible solutions within you. What are the things you can do within the scope of your dream to address that particular problem you have identified? Go ahead and do that. State all the possible solutions. But it is important to know that you don't need to identify a specific solution. At this point, you don't want to say, okay, this is the solution. There is no one singular solution to one problem. There are many solutions to a particular problem. So what you want to do at this point is, by the time you look at it from the overview of the ideal situation, the reality, the consequences, and the proposed solutions, you'll be able to now know what are the solutions you can start to deploy based on where you are now. As contained within your dream. Please go ahead and do that, number one. What's the ideal situation? Describe it. You don't have to write one page. Just one paragraph is enough, the ideal situation. Don't make things complex. Make it very simple. What's the current reality? You can write that in one minute. Number one, this. Number two, this. Number three, that. And I'll show you that now very soon. Number uh, three, what are the consequences of the problem? Number four, what's the proposal you are using to solve the problem? We move on to the second model. The second model is the ICANN model. That's also very simple. ICANN is an acronym, which means number one, introduce the problem. Number two, state the call to action. And number three, describe the negative consequence. Now, while the Ivory Cup model can be used by anybody, it's what I recommend you use. But in case you are someone that you have been analyzing your dream for long, you have been passionate about your purpose, and you are even pursuing it, you will discover that ICANN model becomes very easy for you and helps you to be even very fast and detailed. But either way, anyone you choose to use, go ahead. For someone that is just starting out, I recommend the IRECOP model. It helps you to think very fast and get the job done. Because if you want to go to the ICANN model, it can be a bit tedious. So what's the ICANN model about? Number one, introduce the problem. What's the current problem around the world? Number two, state the call to action. Don't forget, introduce the problem that your dreams seek to solve. You can't solve all the problem in the world. But now that you know your dream, what's the problem that your dream is solving? What's the problem your dream is addressing? Number two, state the call to action. What is the intervention you are bringing in? And number three, describe the negative consequences if action isn't taken to solve the problem. That is, if I don't take this step, what are the negative consequences of me not acting to fulfill my dream? Remember, every dream that God gives is given to solve problems for people within territories which also involve people. So people, anywhere you find people, there are problems and God is sending you here to solve problems for them. So identify that problem for people in the professional world, people in the church, people in the, a, a particular department, people, a, a, a tribe of people, a territory of people, physical territory, social territory, whatever thing it is, a people of a particular socioeconomic group, so because there are things that put people in different classes, in different nations like that. So you must identify that wherever the people are, you should be able to know who those people are and then what is the problem and what you are bringing in to solve the problem. Now, let's try to run this through a model. This model, two models, let's run them through the life of Jesus. And there are many we can do, but because of time, so that it will make it simple for you. John 10, 10, Jesus came and one day Jesus declared, his problem statement. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. So let's run this through the Iron Cup model. In the Iron Cup model, we said, what's the ideal situation? So when you look at this dream of Jesus Christ, what's the ideal situation? A situation where there are no crises, there are no problems. We see towards the end abundant life. People should have abundant life. That is the ideal thing. Abundant life. 
Now, if you have agreed with me, now you can see how simple it is. So you don't have to be writing one paragraph, just one statement, two statements, simple statements. It's okay. For Jesus, the ideal situation for people should be abundant life. They should have life and have it more abundantly. Number two, what is the current reality? Because the reason why you are here, you have a dream is because the ideal situation is not the current situation. There is a gap. So you also want to define the current reality. When you define the current reality, you are able to identify the gap and know how to fill it, what you bring in to fill the gap. So what's the current reality for Jesus? The current reality is this, that there is a thief in town. People, remember, in this situation, people should have abundant life. The current reality, there is a thief in town. The thief has come, and that is the current reality. Now that the thief has come, what are the consequences? So the problem people have is there, there is a thief in town. What are the consequences of the presence of that problem, of the presence of that thief in town? So simple. He's stealing, he's killing, and he is destroying. So people are constantly being stolen from. Things, they are losing their things, their spiritual resources. Some people are losing their health. Some people are losing their finances, losing their destinies, and all manner of things. The things he cannot steal, he kills. And the things he cannot kill, he destroys. That is his duty. So people are being destroyed. People are being killed. People are being stolen from. So those are the three consequences. I believe it's becoming easier for you. It's making more sense. And finally, what's the proposal Jesus is giving from this one statement? The proposal is, I have come. That you should have life. So I have come. I carry the solution to give you life and to restore you back to the ideal situation. So Jesus Christ himself, remember, is life. John 1.1. 1, 1, and the world became life. And that life became the light of everyone that comes to this world. So the life of God now is restored to us when Jesus came. Do you understand me now? Now that you get that, so you can see that within this one verse, this short verse, everything about the Iron Cup model, we have been able to run it. So again, I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be one page. This is just one or two statements. Yours can also be the same thing. Now, let's run it through the ICANN model. Number one, introduce the problem. What's the problem? Jesus Christ identified the problem here. And what's the problem? The problem is that there is a thief in town. And because the thief is in town, there is a crisis everywhere. So now that there is a problem, what's the call to action? I have come to give people life. My presence here is to stop the activity of the thief and to give to the people what the thief had stolen. And what's the consequence? The consequence of me not delivering my solution or fulfilling my dream. This consequence is that the thief will keep stealing, the thief will keep killing, and the thief will keep destroying. So people will lose their valuables, People will be killed and people will be destroyed with their dreams. And so that's the justification for me coming to fulfill my dream. So that becomes very easy. So you can use any of these models, you know, to create your problem statement. Having done that, there are many other things you can use to analyze and build for that. But I think for now, this is okay. In subsequent master classes, we will pick each of these elements and we try to dig in deeper. But with these that have been done, you are ready to move on to the next phase, which is quantifying your dream. Now we move on to the next, which is quantify your dream. Remember how we began, clarify your dream. Secondly, we said you must prioritize your dream. Thirdly, we said you have to analyze your dream. And now number four, quantify your dream. Your dream is in your mind, so it's still intangible. So you have to make it tangible. How do you do that? You have to make it relevant by bringing it and betting it to reality. And the beginning of that is bringing it to reality from your mind to paper. So the first thing you want to do is write a story. I will not beat about the bush. I will be very direct here. Pick out a piece of paper now. Just pause this video. If you leave it till later, you will not do it. Pick out a piece of paper now and write two paragraphs. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just imagine, close your eyes and imagine um, your dream. Imagine the future 10 years from now. What is even 10 years from now? Imagine 50 years from now. 
how your dream is changing the world, how your dream is, being, is, is benefiting people, is transforming lives, and write down what you can see. The impact of your dream that is having on the world, on your territory, on your line of profession, and on the people around you, write it down. The moment you've done that, you have an idea of what should happen, which is very good. The next thing you will do is ask yourself, what is the estimated monetary valuation of your dream? Now, this is where we try to be religious. Many of us, money is very important. So everyone must plan for it. So when you have a dream, don't just leave it like that abstract. Now I have seen what my dream is. For example, possibly your dream could be, you know, to solve problems, marital problems in the society. If that's your dream. Now, I just said it like that because um, that will not be your calling. God has given you your calling, which is also connected to that. Don't forget from the first session. But then when you put it in a dream form, you're saying to solve problem within the society and not just blank society. You have a defined location or territory, which you're talking about. For somebody, maybe it could be among ministers of the gospel. Now you are furthering niching it because many ministers are having marital crisis. For another person, it, it may be to help peak performance among corporate executives, and you are solving their marital problems because marital problems can actually drain energy. So you have defined something there. So don't just leave it blank. And that's why it's important you know how to script your dream and go back to that video, see every detail there, script your dream. So imagine the impact of your dream, the fulfillment. People will become more productive. And as they are more productive, you know, they, they have good homes. They have a home they are proud of. They have a wife they could show off to everyone. And, you know, they are happy to showcase the success of their home everywhere. You know, that's what we're saying. They are very productive. Nothing is draining their energy. So just imagine yourself speaking to people in the boardrooms. Imagine yourself flying all around the world, you know, to change cultures, philosophies, ideas that homes are currently being built on to help people. Because many of them may not even be Christians. So that even helps you to know how to package, you know, your message and tailor it to the unbelievers. Because everyone in the corporate sector understands one language, productivity. So when you mention productivity to them, productivity is money. Anything that can help you to save time. I've saved you money. I've saved you your career. So for them, they understand it. Now, I'm just giving an example now. So when you've done that, now imagine how big it is. Now, if you're going to do that, it means that in the future, you are touching around. I'm trying to imagine what it is. Like, that's not my calling. So I can't depict it clearly. But I'm looking at you. Uh, let's assume you're in Nigeria for now. And in your country, you're moving from one place to the other. It's going to cost you money. Just imagine what are you using to move. At a point, will you need a private jet to make your journey easier? Maybe you need to move all over, all over Africa. Very important. Now you need maybe uh, one of the things that these people used to have is that they hardly have time for recreation with their couples. I mean, with their spouses, rather. And so maybe you're looking at, oh, building a resort center, a Christian resort center or a resort center where people can just come, you know what, with their family. And when they come, they can really just have a nice time together. And at the same time, you have packaged a lot of activities and a lot of teachings that will help them to foster unity. So how often will it happen? How frequent will it happen? They are looking forward to it. They are registering. So you're asking yourself, what will be needed at one point? What will be needed at one point? Now you need real estate. You need to have it. Are you having it just one? In a, in a nation, how many nations of the world are we having it? Okay, do we have it? Maybe Africa, let's mention Africa, um, put Africa in six regions and then one center per region. All these things cost money. Are you having it all over the world? Okay, if we are not going to be building in some part of the world because of cost, now it means we are going to be renting or leasing. How much does it cost? So ask yourself, what is the estimated monetary valuation? Now, the big picture of your success, try to account for it financially. So, and at this point, I must tell you, think big. I know somebody, you are tempted, oh, well, 100 million. And 100 million is not even dollars. You are saying Naira. And so, this is it. Let me give you this. 100 million naira is too small. 
or a dream. We are talking about the fullness of the success of a dream. So it means we are starting from the pursuit, all the money you will ever need from pursuit to the peak of the success. That's what we're talking about. So how much is 100 million? How much is 1 billion? As we talk presently, there is a church that is under construction that will be one of the largest church buildings in the world. As at when the budget was made, before this inflation now in our country, it was estimated to be 160 billion naira. 160 billion naira. So if you are thinking of 100 million naira, just 100 million naira, just imagine one building is costing 160 billion. So I like you to think big. Just do that and do your valuation, your dream valuation in your currency. If you're watching from the US and you're in the US, why not dollars? Nigeria, Naira, Ghana, cities. And wherever you're watching from, just make sure that you put that. In the UK, the pound sterling, and make sure you dream big enough because that's all the money. If all the money you will need in your lifetime for your dream, just put it there that if you don't get any other money again, this money is enough for your entire life and for your entire dream. That's what we're talking about when you quantify your dream. So possess a big picture of the success story of your dream. Number one, write the success story. Number two, get the monetary valuation, which is important. And until you have done that, don't watch this video further because every other thing we are doing now will be building on that monetary valuation. Now let's move on to the next topic. Number five, remember we begin again from clarify your dream number one. Step two, we said you have to prioritize your dream. Step three, analyze your dream. Step four, quantify your dream. After you have quantified your dream, the next thing you want to do is to align your life to your dream. Now, this is where we want to be sure that that dream you have, let's assume your valuation. Now, listen, I will use 100 million era for those that may be thinking that small. So that you even know that 100 million era, you know the work and the tax side of you. You see, anybody can dream. Call your two-year-old child, or let me say your five-year-old child, and ask your child, what do you want to become? In big, big words will be telling you. Some will even tell you, I want to be the president of my country. Um, Daddy, mommy, I want to have my own jet. I want to have my own, in fact, some will tell you, I want to have my own rocket. Anybody can dream, you know, in that world, in that realm. But it takes real people to actualize the dream. So the first thing you want to do is to audit your life currently, the way it is now. Test your dream against your life reality and see whether there is an alignment. And if there is uh, the places where there are no alignment, you want to fine tune your life, your lifestyle, to ensure that it complies with your dream. Because at the end of the day, you are the most important person in that dream. Not even God, because God is the most important on the earth in, in heaven. He has packaged you, sent you here. So you become entirely responsible for the outcomes of your dream. No matter what God has done or what God is going to be doing, if you do nothing, if you are not intentional, your dream will become a mere wish and prayer point. And that's what many of us are doing. Prayer point, wishes, that's all we have but you must be intentional. This is one of the things the people in the world understand. So I have divided, divided this, and I really thank God for a man that you know, made me to understand this, one of my mentors. I mentioned his name now, um, Peter J. Daniels. He should be, he's in his 90th or 91st year now. He has been an amazing influence and an amazing blessing to me. You know, I learned about how to audit your life from him. And from that, I have... After I've applied it to my life and I saw my growth and I have also expanded that work, I've been able to build on it, seeing areas that need improvement and to help people also to do it. Now, this is one thing I've done for people. This is an entire workshop. This number five is an entire three hour workshop that when you pass through your life cannot remain the same. And so I'd like you to take this serious. Now, we are going to be using as our case study a hundred million dollar valuation, a hundred million naira valuation dream. If it's your currency, hundred million dollars. So hundred million of your currency. And so the first thing you want to do, there are three areas we are going to test your life. The first one being the personal requirement, the second one basic requirement, and the third one limiting factors. 
Now, the personal requirement, anyone that will build a dream that is worth a hundred million dollars must know, or hundred million naira, or whatever currency you have, must know that it doesn't come by chance or luck. You must be intentional. So there are exact requirements that are needed to be met. Are they in place? If they are not in place, then you must be ready to build them there. Because if you don't have them, then that dream will never come to fruition. And number one of such now, as we start, what I want you to do, bring out your notepad or bring out a piece of paper. Each of these, as we mentioned in them, rate yourself from a scale of zero to 10. On a scale of zero to 10, it's very important you do this at this point. As I'm talking, be working. If you don't do it now, you will not do it again. That's one thing you must know. So at this point, you want to keep the momentum. So number one is your imagination. You remember I told you in the definition of a dream, a divinely inspired picture idea within your imagination. So you must have it in your consciousness. And when we talk about your imagination, we're talking about clarity. Is your dream now the valuation of your dream? Do you clearly have it in your mind? How clear, how real is it to you that you, you have a dream worth $100 million? How real is that $100 million to you that you can achieve it? How real? Because for some people, when you mention it, wow, they think it's Hollywood. They think it's, it's in Nollywood. They think it's in Bollywood. They think yeah, that can only happen in movie. Some people, it's fantasy. That's not reality. So to you, it must be so real. Ask yourself, what's the clarity level? How real is it to me? In my imagination, can do I see myself achieving this in my lifetime? On a scale of zero to 10, rate yourself. And you can only tell yourself the truth. I want you to be very truthful at this point. You are not showing this to anyone. You are only showing it to yourself. So you can't afford to lie to yourself. Number two, the under the personal requirement is pressure. If you want to run a dream of a hundred million dollars, uh, there will be moments of pressure. When you are test against reality, there will be political pressures. There will be pressure from the society. There will be pressure from all manner of uncertainties around you. And you come under pressure. At times you have to make decisions under pressure. At times you have to forge the even in spite of the pressure. When you come under pressure, how well do you handle pressure? Because some people break under pressure. Some people are like, I'm tired. Now, how do you do this? Don't assume I'm a strong person. No, you must be very real. Pick out three times. The previous three times you have worked, pressure has come your way in your line of work, your line of duty. Now, now that you have been exposed to pressure, how well did you undo it? If by now you want to undo that same situation, what would you have done differently? Compare those two things. What, how you undoed it then and how you would have undoed it differently now. And ask yourself, what is the disparity level between them? On a scale of zero to 10, rate yourself. That's how to be very factual with yourself. And so number three, your perception. If you're building a dream of a hundred million dollars, a hundred million naira, or whatever your currency is, your perception must be top notch. because decisions are based on perceptions now decisions are powerful because every decision you make takes you to a direction so if you make right decisions you go towards the right direction and if you go towards the right direction you end up in the right destination you make wrong decisions it takes you towards a wrong direction and wrong direction over time that is unchecked will take you to wrong destination so if you are going to make the right decision you must have the right perception how do you know your perception so simple the last 10 decisions I have made, vital decisions, important decisions that I have made, how many of them did I make correctly? Now, how do you know the ones you made correctly and the ones you made correctly? If I were to make the decision again, what would I have done differently? Ask yourself how many. Maybe if you made, if you're satisfied with two and the other eight, you would have done it differently. It means that's a two over 10. If you're satisfied with five, that's a five over 10. So you can rate yourself easily. Number three is your tenacity. Your tenacity, when we talk about your tenacity here, we are simply referring to how daring are you? How daring? Have you seen a bulldog before? A bulldog holds on to someone, to a thief, for example, doesn't let go. How tenacious are you? 
when you believe something seriously, how committed are you? Even when you're failing, I won't give up. Your uh, never give up attitude. And this is very easy. Just imagine your past, things you have done in the past. How often do you give up? Are you someone that when you start, you must follow it to the end? Even if it's a fail, if it's going, if it's seeming that it's going to fail, you want to get to that end. You don't want to be someone that abandons things, you know, halfway. So how tenacious are you? How daring are you? Very important. So rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. How disciplined are you? That's the next one, discipline. Discipline talks about your ability to stick to something that is to be a law to yourself. I'm not going to do what is convenient. I'm going to do what is commanded or what is needed. It's a must. I'm not going to wait for me to be motivated. I don't need to be motivated. I don't need to be inspired. I am doing it because it must be done. And if I don't do it, there is a consequence. That's discipline. Oh, not, I don't feel like, I don't feel like um, doing this thing today. Because I've been doing it, nothing is even showing up. No. You are doing it because you are committed to that dream. It's not because it's yielding results now. So commitment. How committed are you to things? So just imagine. And how do you know how disciplined you are? Just ask yourself. When I, I'm, uh, I've talked about things I want to do, maybe I tell someone I want to do this. How disciplined am I in executing, carrying out my duties? How disciplined? Rate yourself. Rate yourself. You can easily determine this from your day-to-day -day activities. And the last one there is resi resilience. How resilient are you? Resilience here, yeah, in this context, it may not be the normal definition you are. I'm talking about it as your ability to bounce back from failures, from rejections, from defeat. You have once been defeated. You have asked yourself, how fast and how well do I quickly bounce back? Because even the scripture says, a righteous man may fall seven times while you will rise up again. So God expects that every time we suffer rejection, every time we suffer from failure, we must come back up again because failure is only an event. You must learn from failure, then move on. So how well, the same thing, think about the last 10 times or the last three times and ask yourself, how well do I respond to defeat? How well do I respond to failure? Am I someone that just surrenders or am I someone that always feel, no, I've learned something, I can always go back. And how well is that? Rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. Now we move on to the next one, which is the basic requirement. In order for you to build a $100 million, a $100 million naira dream, in your lifetime, there are basic requirements now outside your personal requirements. But these are basic requirements for everyone, applies to everyone. Now, your personal requirement, let's assume you don't have resilience. You can work on building it or you can manage it. You can get people that will be dogged. That's the truth. If you, may, if you are not someone that is very good with intuition at making decisions, you can work and collaborate with people that can make such decisions, that can work under pressure. That's personal requirement. So when you see what is lacking in your personal requirement, you look at it. What are the areas of this personal requirement that I'm falling short? Can I improve on them? And how do I improve on them? If there are areas I cannot improve on because that's my nature, maybe that's not my weakness. You don't fight your weaknesses. You can manage them. How do I do it? And then you start building a team around it. I get this person, I get this person, this is how I can manage it. This is how I can make sure I navigate through the system. I can put a system in place that helps me to make decisions. If I'm someone that don't know how to make prompt, instant decision, then I can create a system making decision. So you are trying to manage it. But you see, when it comes to the basic requirement, this is a must. You can't manage anything. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Your dream becomes a wish. It becomes a fantasy. You can't delegate it to anyone. Basic requirement is the standard to everyone on the earth. Whether you are a believer, you are an unbeliever, it's a law that stands. So that's what we're looking at now. Number one, again, on a scale of zero to 10. So number one is your desire. Do you really desire, how strongly do you desire this dream that is worth a hundred million dollars? How strongly, what's your desire? Of course, everyone have great desire, but not everyone. Let me say that. I've met with people that 
their desire level is below two. And you're asking yourself, then what are you living for? Their desire level is below because life has taught them harsh lessons, hard reality. And so I found myself that you have to help them and to desire again. Somebody has failed three times that his desire ability has been killed. So we have to help the person to start to believe again in God, to believe in himself again, and to believe that he can achieve it. I hope you understand that. And in case you're watching that right now, and that's who you are, you can dream again, you can believe again. So your desire, rate on a scale of 0 to 10. Number two there is your routine. What's your routine? What's your routine? Now, when I talk about routine here, I'm talking about Supposing you are doing what you have been doing the last five years, the way you wake up, the way you live your life now, things you do on a daily basis, if you continue to do in the last five years, if you continue doing it exactly without adding anything to it, what's the assurance that you are going to be able to build a dream of a hundred million dollars or hundred million naira? What's your assurance? You must ask yourself at this point. And so. If what I've been doing in the past five years cannot take me to my future, then it means I have to start changing it. Routines are very powerful, friends. Routine, they are very powerful. What you do daily, how you do things daily, influences on where you ultimately end up. And so one of the things I would do to help you is this. In case you're saying, yes, it can, it can. If it can, it would have taken you very far now. So this is how to go about it. Do you have a routine in place? Is Monday different from Tuesday for you? Tuesday, is it different from Wednesday? You see, the way a productive person works is this. Every day, must there is a pattern that surrounds each day. There is a pattern. When you wake up, there is a system in place, a routine, that the, what you do immediately, you wake, the time you wake up is known. You don't sleep anytime you like. You don't wake up anytime you like. There's a time you must sleep. There's a time you wake up. And when you wake up, there are five items, four items that you do. It's automated. There are books that can help you to do this, that can, that can, that can teach you, you know, on how to do this. And um, possibly I'll put recommendations in the description box, which you can watch out for. Atomic Habit is good. It's a good place to start. And so it will be a good, it will be of good help for you. You wake up, you're not thinking, what will I do? Your day tomorrow has been planned. It's the last thing you did yesterday. And so when you wake up in the day, you know what you should be doing. You know where you should be. You know what you should do. On Mondays, you know what you're doing. Tuesdays, you know what you're doing. And those days are not too much of a difference from them, themselves. Your Monday this week is the same thing as next week, Monday. There's a pattern. People can, there's an element of predictability as far as your schedule, your routine is concerned. So your status quo, if what you are doing now, your current status quo, if you continue doing it, what you've been doing for the past five years, can it take you to your future? If the answer is no, then do something about it because it means you will never get there. So ask yourself a hundred million dollars, a hundred million Naira or whatever your currency is will demand this kind of ethic. This it will demand this kind of routine. And do I have that routine? And rate yourself on a scale of zero to ten. Now the next one is productivity. Productivity here talks about your work ethic. How hard do you work and how smart do you work? Because I, when, they, when I say how hard do you work, many people will say I work very hard. I give myself an eight, an eight. I give myself a nine. I give myself a ten. But then how efficient and effective are you in your work? How productive are you? So because it's not about doing things, it's about getting results, productivity. How productive are you with your time? Productivity here doesn't talk about the volume of work done. It talks about the amount of time, the amount of energy, the amount of resources you invested in the right thing that gets you the right result. So how do you know how productive you are? Just look out for the result which you are obtaining. On daily basis, check out your level of result. On weekly basis, on monthly basis, on annual basis, check out your level of result. You must be able to track your result as a human being, especially as a believer, track your result. That was what Jesus lived for. There was a time when they were celebrating that, oh, master, they are looking for you. And you know, disciples went to meet him. Jesus, you are here praying early in the morning. 
People are looking for, you know what Jesus told them? He said, I'm done here. There are other places I need to be. There are places that need to hear what I am saying. The gospel has not been preached. Them. Let's go over there. I want to be productive. I don't just want to be full of activities. It's very important that we take note of this. So rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. You have to be productive. Number four there is your knowledge absorption ratio. The rate at which you absorb knowledge. And what that simply means is simple. Um, if I expose you to a knowledge, you're a medical doctor and your dream is in the medical world and suddenly you are exposed to um, economics. Somebody in economics teaches you economics or somebody in social media marketing teaches you social media marketing and you are expected to carry that body of knowledge and teach it to people, explain it to other people the same way a professional we explain to them and they will understand. You are due to nice to explain it to them in such a way they will understand. You may not be as erudite as the professional in that field, but you are able to break down everything that person has told you, the information he has given you. You are able to break it down to others in such a way that they are able to take action, meaningful actions that will transform their lives with that information. How well can you handle that? Do you know why you need that? I'll tell you this. When you learn something new, that new knowledge is supposed to help you to get a level of result in your pursuit. How do you know whether you understand it well enough is when you can also explain it to others and they can understand it. That's when you know you actually understand the knowledge you have acquired. Now, why do you need this? If you're going to build a $100 million dream, you will need to know many things. You may not know them in details, but you know a bit of them. You know a bit of them. You see, you need to learn on the go to be someone that will be that result-oriented, someone that will command that level of influence and you know success. You must be a peak performer. You must be a highly productive person. And if you be a peak performer, you must be a peak learner. You will learn on the job. You know, you're traveling um, as a medical doctor, you're traveling maybe to Singapore for a summit there. And the moment you land there, there are some new initiatives and these new, new initiatives cut across, you know, some openings in rural areas, possibly in Africa or in some other third world nations. And suddenly what jumps at you at first instance is maybe uh, urban shelter, maybe, I mean, sorry, rural shelter or possibly beyond health now, you're seeing poverty stare you in face. So you need to plan with finances. You cannot say, oh no, that's not my duty. Let's get an accountant or an economist to do that. No, you have to make decisions within the next one hour. And so you must have an idea, the ability will learn what is happening now. You must be able to quickly learn it in case you don't even know it before. Now, somebody explains to you, now this is the implication of this poverty on the health of these people or on the program we want to do. And so with that, you're able to quickly imagine what is the impact of this on this. As the person is explaining that knowledge to you, you are able to pick it and see actually for yourself. And so that's why you must know that your knowledge absorption must be top notch. And let me say this, in case your knowledge absorption is low, let me teach you how to go about it. How to go about it is intentionally start looking for areas you know nothing about that you see that in your dream, your dream will need it and start learning. Don't just read. Don't just study. Learn. There is a difference between learning and reading. Learning is done by you. Reading is done by yourself. Somebody can teach you, but it's important you know this, that no matter how good someone is teaching you, it's possible you have learned nothing. Learning is something that you do consciously yourself. And so you ask yourself, after every new information you have come across, what have I learned from here? How can I apply it? I believe application is one of the best ways you learn. So rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. The next thing is faith. Hmm. If you will build a hundred million dollars dream, you will assume with, you agree with me that there are limitations. You don't have everything. It's just in your imagination, it's just in your idea. But when you try to think of reality, you ask yourself, why are you to dream that big? 
That's where you need faith. It may not look it, but you need faith. And see, I'm not yet to define faith. So you can read a lot of books, you can listen to a lot of messages about that. But how do you know? How do you rate your faith? So simple. Because the Bible tells us that faith can grow. So you need to rate it now so that you know whether you need to start growing your faith. Of course, we need to keep growing your faith, but you need to know how urgent you need to work on this. And so ask yourself, the moment whereby um, some things eluded me, what was the role of my faith? And the things I have acquired and achieved that God has done for me, what was the role of my faith? Ask yourself. Because if a man believes, he said, he will speak to a mountain, be removed. And when he speaks to that mountain and he doesn't doubt in his heart, he shall have what he says. So what are you having presently? Are there things you are saying? Are there things you are desiring that you are not yet having? Check them in your life. And there are some things you are saying, there are some things you're doing that you are having. Check them and weigh them to each. I mean, weigh them on the balance and ask yourself on a scale of zero to 10, what's my faith level? You need good faith to be able to command good results. Very important. Noah was a man of faith. So he was called to build an ark. And when he did that, he needed faith. So we move on to the next one, which is your devotion. What is your devotion? To build a hundred million dollars dream, you need a sound devotion. Except you want to do it the way they do it in the world. And I believe you're a child of God. And if you're a child of God, you know you can't do it without God. So if you must do it in partnership with God, you must know this place that you must be able to hear from God because you can't have it all figured out. No matter the plan you create now, you will still always need God. There are so many uncertainties in the world that you will need God guiding you. The Holy Spirit has to be speaking to you part time, every year, every day, you know, guiding you. You are working in partnership with him to actualize this. So what's your prayer life like? Do you have a fixed prayer time? on daily basis? What's the time you spend in prayer? Is it that you spend five minutes today, tomorrow you spend two hours, and then next tomorrow you didn't pray at all? If that is what you are currently doing, just rate yourself. You don't have to be ashamed. You can start from somewhere. And this is my encouragement. If, instead of going for two hours at a stretch that you cannot sustain, start with 30 minutes that you can maintain. And as you begin to do 30 minutes today, you do 30 minutes tomorrow at a specific time. You discover something that the grace to grow, God begins to give to you. Again, what's your word? What's your word meditation like? I didn't say study. You study the word before you can meditate. Now you have studied the Bible. How well do you meditate? Because you have to meditate day and night if you must obtain good success. And meditation is not what they call in the world. You must know. We must be very careful of what goes on right now that they are bringing into Christianity. You are not doing yoga. Yoga. So all this, close your eyes and just start thinking the promises of God for you. Um, you are the light of the world. See yourself shining. And you, you start doing that. No, that's not the scriptures. The word meditate from the scriptures, what it means actually in the, in the um, Hebrew word is muttering. You mutter. You are muttering. For example, say to the righteous man, it shall be well with him and they shall eat of their fruit of their doing. If that is the word of God I have caught for my life, and you know what? I, I, I will pick it up, and I, I, I want to meditate on that word day and night. Now, listen. I saw that word, it struck me. Oh. I am walking in my place of work. Say to the righteous man, it shall be well with him, and they shall eat of the fruit of their doing. I am walking on the road, I'm, anything I'm doing, say to the righteous man. Now, as even I am sitting down in my house, I am in a place where I'm in a prayer mode. Say the righteous man is well with it. As I'm doing that, something happens because you have the Holy Spirit on your inside. The word he speaks to you, they are life and they are spirit. As I begin to do that, suddenly understanding begins to come alive because there's something about repeating it, muttering it, muttering it. It's traveling into your spirit, man. It's becoming something in your mind. So they say to the righteous man, he shall be well with him. And he shall I'm a righteous man. Now, it's no longer said to the righteous man, I'm a righteous man, therefore, it is well with me. It is well with me. I'm a righteous man. It is well with me. I'm a righteous man. I shall eat of the fruit of my doing. I'm not permitted to eat all my doing. It is of my doing that I will eat. So, whatever thing I do, the labor of my hand is sufficiently enough for me and to, for me to be a blessing to others. And so, you know, 
He's just trying to say, saying all those things. So at this point, you are no longer saying, say to the righteous man, it shall be well with him. At this point, you're saying, I'm a righteous man. It is well with me. Everything is working well for me. The fruit of my doing is sufficiently enough for me. No more lack in my life. I'm sufficiently catered for from the fruit of my doing in such a way that I'm also a blessing to the people around me. Now, that word is coming alive to you. You find yourself, you do a lot of things. You see, the reason why many believers are struggling right now is because their meditation practice is low. Low. The situations around us in our countries, the situations around us in our nation, in our neighborhood, is such that it's reducing the time we spend meditating. You go to your workplace, you can't meditate. You, you are at home, you can't meditate. You watch the news, you can't meditate. You are depressed, all manner of things. Yes, I know you study the word of God, but you are not meditating because your success is tied to your meditation. So in the world, you find out that those guys that are really succeeding in the world, they tell you they are having their time of meditation. You know, don't forget what I told you they are doing in their own meditation. The time they sit down, they play some cool music, and they do some yoga practice. But in your case, you are a child of God, and the word of God tells you how to meditate, and you are not doing it. So what's your meditation level? And then after you have done your meditation, how do you comply with the word of God in obedience? What the word of God is saying, how well, how prompt do you comply? Very important. And these three things together, your prayer, your meditation, and your, compl um, your compliance level is what I call your devotion. So I believe that helps someone right now. Good. So having gone through that, the next thing we want to do is we want to look into the limiting factors. Don't forget, I begin again. The personal requirement is important because there are things you need to have. But again, I said, in case you find yourself in some areas, you don't have them, you can actually build a team around it that can help you manage them. But you see this basic requirement, it's a must for you to have all of them. So you're asking yourself, in which areas am I falling short? Then develop a work plan to grow in these areas. Because if you don't grow in these areas, your, 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 your effort now is towards making them 10. Or even from 7 upwards. The faster you build, the, you build these things, these requirements, then the faster you realize your dream. That's how it works. So that's why I used to tell people that you don't work towards a goal. Your goal must be your growth. Because when you grow to become the person in your dream, your dream will become realized. In that dream, you are the most important person. So don't run for the dreams or for the things in the dream. Run to be the person in that dream. That identity I spoke of in your dream in the first um, session. Try to become that person. The moment you become that person, what that person has, you have everything. What that person is doing or what that person is able to do, the potentials of that person, you start manifesting it. Very important. Now, I move on to the third one, which is the limiting factors. Now, this is what many believers don't like talking about. I love talking about limiting factors. I love seeing the obstacles. They say, no, no, look beyond the obstacles. They say, look beyond the obstacles. You don't have to talk about, you know, challenges. Don't talk about resistances. I believe I can do all things. I'm not saying you cannot do all things. Let me show you the nature of God. And then you as a child of God, how you must also do the same thing. When God created the earth and the heavens, he knew that there would be challenges. God is omniscient. You know what God did? He took the lamb, sacrificial lamb, and slain him before he created Adam. Before the devil rebelled, he did that work. Now you find that in Revelation chapter, I think Revelation chapter 5. The lamb that was slain before the world began. Very important. So when the devil came on the scene and he began to misbehave, God was just laughing. When he went to meet Adam and made Adam to fall, God was laughing. Because as a matter of fact, God told him, this woman will give birth to a seed, and that seed will bruise your head. God was, because God knew he's part of the program. So you must always plan. You must plan for limitations. 
you must understand that your dream, you are in the world where uh, things don't go always as planned. So you must tell yourself, what if things don't go on well? What can I do? You must create scenarios. When people in the corporate world, when they are planning strategies and, you know, you don't just plan one strategy and say, this is what we'll do. Now, the nation I come from, that's what we do here. We just say, okay, this is our budget. This is what we want to do. They don't even ask themselves. Okay, they formulate policies and they don't say, what if in the implementation of this policy, we encounter what are the potential challenges we will encounter? And then they identify all those challenges. You must know it. You must know them. And you, ident you identify them and you say, okay, good. Encountering these challenges, what are the things we will do if we meet this challenge? Because it's going to affect the way, the method that we are pursuing this goal. How do we remain flexible enough to be able to navigate around these challenges, overcome it, and then fulfill our goal? So when we plan, you know, with limiting factors in mind, it helps us to be very flexible to be able to achieve our goals. And it gives us an, an edge. So I showed you the nature of God the Father that he always emphasized, you know, the end from the beginning. Now, look at Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ in his dream, when he was going, hear what he told the apostles. He said, I'm committing a work to your hand. This is my dream. Now I'm transmitting it to you. We will be working together to make sure it is done because I will be with you to the end of the year. Don't forget that scripture. As you find that in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 20. And he went further to say something. He said, when they arrest you and they bring you before the judges, he said, don't be scared of what you will say. He said, because the spirit of your father that dwells inside of you will speak through you. Now, he was quickly telling them that it's not going to be bird of roses. It's not going to be bird of roses. You will be faced with challenges. But when you are faced with challenges, these are the solution. So I have seen the challenges ahead. And then I have made a provision to help you to overcome the challenges. If God, in planning his own dream, if God has that in mind, if Jesus has that in mind, then why must you walk carelessly? You must be like a prudent man, not the simple man who is not able to foresee danger, according to Proverbs, and just fall into it. So what are the limiting factors? What are the factors that can hinder you. We have checked out the personal requirement. We've checked out the basic requirement. Now, what are the things that can be your mountain that you have to speak against and you have to work against? You have to plan around. What are those things that can hinder you? What are those things that have the ability to limit your dream from finding expression? Number one, cash. <laughs> Money and silent all things. That's what the scripture says. You will agree with me that you don't have the, you don't even have all the money. To free your dream. Your dream is $100 million now. Do you have it in your bank account? No. So on a scale of 0 to 10, ask yourself, how will I rate myself on cash? Now, let me help you out. If you say you are rating yourself 10 over 10, it means you're saying your dream valuation, which is $100 million. Now, I don't know what your own is, but... You know, the case study we are using is $100 million or $100 million. If your dream valuation is $100 million, $100 million, what you are simply saying is, and I'm giving myself 10, I have $100 million in my account now, cash. If you rate yourself five, you're saying I have 50 million. If you rate yourself one, you're saying I have 10 million. That's just simple calculation. Simple maths. And if you rate yourself 0 0.1, you are saying I have $1 million. In Naira, you are saying I have $1 million. So I've helped you enough. Answer your question. Rate yourself. Number two, association. Talking about friendships. Now, by now you know that you can't build a $100 million dream alone. You need people. I will not go into the theology of relationship or association. But one thing I will tell you is this. 
God did not design life for isolation. He designed it for association. So we function well by association. How do you know the quality of association you have? Look at your life presently. Top seven people around you and ask yourself, among these seven people that influences my decisions on daily basis. Now, listen to me carefully. It's possible that someone influences your decision. Someone like me. I have people, I will not mention their names. I have people that influence my decisions on daily basis. I have never met with them. I consider them my friends. I consider them mentors. Now, they have a strong influence on me more than the people I see physically. You must know that. But I'm not like everybody and you're not like me. There are some people that that's not who they are. So you have to be very factual with yourself. I've done this over time. See, I've been doing this since 2016. You must know this. And so it has helped me to be very intentional. So I have people that influence my prayer life. I have people that influence my study life. I have people that influence my financial life. I have people that influence everything about when I see their lives, when I see the way they behave, when I read their books, I practice immediately without waiting. So who are those people around you? And list seven of them out. Put your family as one, then others. Ask yourself, out of these seven, how many of them are on their way to building $100 million dreams or have built it or have done more than that? Ask yourself. If you have seven over seven, rate yourself. 10 over 10. If you have four over seven, give yourself like 60%. If you have one over seven, then you know what to give yourself. That is less than one. Find a way to rate yourself. The meaning is this. Your association determines your future. So simple. The next one we want to talk about is resourcefulness. How resourceful are you? When I talk about resourcefulness in this context, we're talking about finding creative ways to overcome obstacles and challenges. Challenges will come your way. How creative, creative are you to navigate these issues? And how do you know? So simple. Look at your life. Examine your life. Especially when cash is a major constraint. How well have you been able to navigate you know, that situation, that circumstance, come out of it on top, not as a defeat? No, you came out winning. And people are asking, how did you do it? Check out those past situations of like four, five times. And how did you do it? Did you come out really on top? Did you struggle with it? How well do you do it? Now rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. Because if you're going to build a $100 million dream, you must be highly resourceful. There is no time to spend time in failure. At times, you must make do with what you have to actualize the result you want. So how well do you harness what you have per time to get what you want? How well do you harness the people around you, the cash around you, the opportunities around you to get the right result? That's how resourceful you are. The next one we move on to is strategy. Now, one of my mentors said that if you lack a strategy, you will suffer tragedy. Now, do you have a strategy in place right now to help you actualize a $100 million dream? You know your own valuation. And when you say yes, the question I ask you, can you show me a document now, a paper, or an electronic document that stipulates everything, the year, the time, the moment, the how, the what? That's your plan. If you don't have it at all, give yourself a zero. If you have it, but it's not well detailed, then you know how you rate yourself. But don't tell me I have it in my head. If you have it in your head, zero. Because it's not important in your head. It's important you put it down. You must create your dream on papers, on documents. That's the first realistic, tangible expression you are given it on the earth. That's why he didn't tell, when he was telling Habakkuk, it takes a man to conceive a vision. It takes people to run it. So he told him, that vision I've shown you, write it down, make it plain. Why? So that people, the errors, can run it. 
very important. So it means if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a strategy, no, you don't have anything you're pursuing. So rate yourself on a scale of zero to um, 10. The next one we're looking at there is your worldview. Now, there is a standard definition of worldview. That's not the definition. My context of worldview, as far as this course is concerned, this masterclass is concerned, is this. If you're going to build a $100 million dream, you have to know that you must know, you have to have an idea of almost everything. You are not very knowledgeable in everything, but you have an idea. You have um, an overview. You may not have details, but you have an overview of how things work in Forex. You have an overview of how the medical profession work, an overview of how governance, administration, overview, overview of the legal, of, um, the legal profession, how laws are made, how laws are implemented, because you will need all this information. You don't know the details because you get the professionals to do it, but you must have an overview. So you have an overview of economics so that when you listen to a news right now, you don't, you, that's not the time to be consulting with anyone. Immediately you listen to that news, an economic news, or you hear of a war in a country, immediately what comes to your mind is, how does this impact on my dream? You're able to relate it instantly. You may not be able to give it an accurate, you know, uh, and definite relationship uh, that is well elaborate, but you have an idea of what it may be like. And that helps you to begin to quickly know what to do. And that informs your decision of getting a professional that there is something that we need to do in this area now because it's going to threaten your dream. So if your worldview is limited, your dream will suffer massively for it. Because no matter what you're building, your ignorance in one area can destroy your dream overnight. Very important you know that. You must know the laws that surround your real, real estate. Uh, you're saying, but um, I don't want to be a real, a real estate investor. Now, look at your dream, how big enough it is. A hundred billion dollars dream, maybe you need like that corporate executive that I mentioned that is, is uh, providing marital solution to corporate executives. Now, you want to have like a boot camp. You must know the real estate laws. You may not know it in details, but I, I have an idea of it. You must know how taxes work. You know, those are the things we're talking about, how government policies are made, how they are formulated, and how they affect, you know, the life of the common man, how they affect corporations. You must make sure, how do you improve on your worldview? So simple, make sure you are erudite. Every moment must count. When you are resting, just find something, make reading your practice. Try to watch documentaries because you learn a lot. When you watch movies, your entertainment time should not just be to laugh. No, when you are watching the movie, for example, you are following on, on a lot of things that are happening there. You are watching other things they are not saying. And so you are learning from that. Give yourself exposure. Exposure is one of the things that can help you so much. And so the next one, now rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. The next one we look at here is the percentage of your potential use. Now this you must know. Jesus came in as a 10 over 10 because Jesus, God, came down on the earth. He had to grow as a child and he had to grow into the fulfillment of his destiny. So when he was 30 years old, he had not even used up to 1% of his potentials. But within three and a half years, he exhausted everything to the point that when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Apostle Paul got to a point and said, I have finished my work. The question I want to ask you is this. What percentage of your potential have been used? Now, I told you in the first session and at the beginning of this, at the beginning of this video, there is who God made in heaven. He finished your destiny in heaven and packaged you and sent you to the earth. There is who he has made in the heaven. Now, the person he has made in the heaven and is sent down to the earth is a 10 over 10. How much of that potential of that person have you used on the earth? Now, before you write five, let me help you out. How do you know the percentage of potentials you have used? God said in his word that you are the light of the world. He didn't say you are the light of your city. So it means whatever thing you are doing, even if it's in one corner in your street, is going to impact the world. So how much of your potentials have you deployed to life 
changing or world changing situations. This is how you will help yourself. So, oftentimes when I speak to believers, you know what they say? I want souls. It's, that's justification. So they say, I give myself five. Why? I want souls. No, 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 no. no. You are missing it out. You are supposed to be a soul winner. Jesus wants souls, but he did more than that. Everybody is a soul winner. According to the scriptures, that's what you, that's your nature. And you should win souls. You see, your, the souls you win, when you let your light shine in your area of influence that has been assigned to you, you even win much more souls than what you're doing now. The disciples won, Apostle Peter won two, two, two cities in one day. So you are winning one person and you're saying that's what you're using. No. What's the percentage of a potential use in world changing? Ask yourself, how many things have I done that have changed the world? Okay, begin with this. If you say one, if you if you give yourself one, you rate yourself that I've used 1% of my potential, I will help you now. There are seven continents on the face of the earth. So if you say one, it means you are telling me that you have influenced at least one continent or almost two continents have been influenced by you. Now, if you are in Africa, ask yourself, have I influenced Africa? If the answer is no, then you can't write one. How many nations do you have in Africa? Then if you are in Nigeria or whatever country you are in Africa, ask yourself a question. Have I influenced my nation? So for some of us, we have not even used 0.1% because we are still on our way up. Some of the big, big names in the kingdom of God today that are doing mighty things for God and some of the, even in the world, they have only used 2%, 3% of their potentials and they, have, they are touching the world around about, I mean, all around us. So this is to help us see that there is more to us than we have seen. This is to encourage us that there is what is inside of me that I can express. Rate yourself. Oftentimes when I do this, I give myself less than 0 0.1. Do you know why? There are many things you have not seen about me. There are things I have seen about myself. There are things I have known about myself. And honestly speaking, I'm still very far from it. So it's very important we take note of this. And so when you have done all this, three things, personal requirement, basic requirement, limiting factors. The next thing I want you to do now is this. Ask yourself, how do I move these zeros, these ones, two, three, anything below five? How do I bring them up to five and even take them above five? And that's how to align your life to your dream. Go ahead and do that. Now, you may not answer that question today. How do I? Because that requires a plan. But that helps you to begin to think of how to create a plan. In subsequent master classes, we are going to deal with such things. I will give you the blueprint. I will show you how to do that. So that it becomes a part of your life, your day to day. Remember, your assignment on the earth is to become you. You're, you are not in competition with anyone. You are in competition with yourself. You are here to become that person that God sent here not who the world has made, not who circumstances has made. You want to become who God has sent here. Now we move on to the step six. Step six, after you have aligned your life to your dream, program your dream. Program your dream, schedule your dream. Ask yourself, and that's very simple. Ask yourself, at what age of my life will I have achieved my dream? So that your $100 million dream, ask yourself, what age of my life? Possibly you are 30 years old watching this now and you're saying, okay, at the age of 70, I have fully achieved this dream. It's a success already by 70 years, maybe by 60 years. So if you are saying it's, saying it's by 70 years and you are currently 30 years, it means you have 40 years. So you are writing that down, 70 years old. How many years is it from now? Subtract 30 from 70, you have 40 years. If you are currently watching this and you're 40 years old and you are saying at the age of 60, I would have achieved my dream. So you are saying 60 minus 40, which is 20 years from now. Now, why do you need this? The moment you have this, you have a time frame. You know your time frame in which you must work. 
And the moment you have this time frame, which takes us to the third one, with this specific time frame, set a goal to achieve your dream in this number of years. Develop a program. So you have a smart goal, and from that smart goal, develop a strategic plan year in, year out, year by year, what I must do each year, what I must achieve each, each year in order to make this dream a reality in the next 20 years, in the next 30 years, in the next 40 years. And like that is very important. So program your dream. In subsequent Destiny Masterclasses, I'll take you through on how to do this. But you can read a lot of books on how to set goals and achieve goals. It's very important. So move on to the next one, which is execute your dream. And this is the final part of the framework, execute your dream. You see, if you dream it, you plan it, as long as you won't run it, it won't work. Action is what gives life to dream. Right action. Run, you see, if you are not acting on it, you are killing it. Inaction, I've often said, is number one assassin of dreams. Inaction is the number one assassin is one number one as a scene of dream. So start working, start acting, start working towards it. It's very important. So again, number one, clarify your dream. Number two, we said you must prioritize your dream. Number three, you analyze your dream. Number four, we said you quantify your dream. Number five, align your life to your dream. Number six, schedule your dream or program it. And number seven, you have to execute, execute. You see, you don't wait there for a perfect time. Remember I told you three things about your dream. Number one, don't negotiate. Number two, don't procrastinate. So at this time, don't procrastinate. Many of us set, you're saying on your tracks, on your marks, get set, get set, go. You don't hear the go. It's only get set. You keep getting set. You say, I'm not ready. Don't let perfectionism, don't let it destroy you. Once you have designed something, start running with it. Clarity is not a one-day job. The more you move, the more you see. The more you move, the more you see. That's how it works. Nothing is going to be perfect without you running. Start running, and then as you are running, you are running towards perfection because you'll be fine. You cannot, you cannot imagine the future, everything at once. As you are moving, you are seeing better, you are knowing better, you are getting better understanding. Your perspective is improving and changing. And that way, you are fine-tuning your dream. But something must be clear enough for you to move. And that's what we have done in this Destiny Masterclass session. I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ that you will succeed beyond your imagination. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that the grace to put this to work, that it rests upon you. I pray in the name of Jesus that where you are right now, within the next one year, when people see you, they will see you that you are already gaining ascendancy to the top in the name of Jesus Christ. You have heard this today, everything you have heard, as you watch it again, as you begin to put it to work, the enablement and the grace to practice this and to be disciplined enough to fulfill your dream, to make it a reality, I pray it rest upon you in the name of Jesus. Please, if you have questions, you can drop it in the comment and I will do well to answer to it. Or you can send me a mail. Uh, you find our, our mail in the description of the video. God bless you abundantly. In case you know somebody needs to watch this, please do me this favor. Share this video with as many friends as you have that you want them also to fulfill their dream. God bless you abundantly. And watch out for our next uh, masterclass session, live masterclass session that we'll be announcing. Make sure you are part of it. There are many other things that we'll do. Now that you can do this, we'll teach you how to program your, your, your dream. We'll flesh it out. We'll teach you how to bridge the gap and how to even set a plan that takes you from zero in all those areas that you have done your live audit to five and five upwards. So please don't miss out on any of our Destiny Masterclass. God bless you abundantly. Now, at the Royal Nation, I need you to know this, that at the Royal Nation, that we believe anyone, any believer, can fulfill destiny when given the right resources, right support, right training, right teaching. And our duty is to provide that to help you as a believer to fulfill your destiny. So we offer corporate training, trainings to churches, to help people unlock their destiny and to give them a roadmap blueprint and to equip and empower them with knowledge to fulfill their destiny. We do this at no cost. So churches, 
um, core member fellowships, youth organizations, corporate organizations that are kingdom driven. Now, this is what we do. So you may even want your leaders, you want to have leadership training. We offer a lot on that for Christian based organizations. So please, you can just send us a mail using that same email address. And then when you send us a mail, um, some of our team, they will reach out to you. We can schedule and arrange a date that will be convenient for us and you. And then we work out on how we are going to meet. So it can either be virtual training, which is online, or physical training, which we come in and then, you know, we hold the training session. Each of our training session is five hours and we have some 10 hours. So those are the two standard training sessions. We do five hours, a bridge, 10 hours, full and long. And that way, anyone that you choose to work with, please, we will appreciate. Help us spread the message, help us share. And in case you are someone that owns an organization, you are watching this right now, please, you can do well and do good by reaching out to us. People deserve to live a life of destiny. People in your church, people in your team members, people in your fellowship, they deserve it. So please reach out to us. The Lord bless you abundantly. God bless you. Bye.